Hi, it's Beefy. Welcome to part three of how to create a wibbly wobbly wheel animation, the Redshift edition. Today, we're going to be adding lighting and textures to our scene in Redshift. As of today, I'm recording this tutorial in Cinema 4D R26 using Redshift 3.5.03. So some things may have changed if you're watching in the future. So how's it going, future you? If you'd like to follow along, then I suggest that you watch parts one and two first. But if you want to just learn about three point lighting and textures in Redshift, then you can do that too. Before we crack on, I'd like to welcome you viewers to the channel. If this is your first time here, then this is a place where I post tutorials, tips and other stuff. If you're into Cinema 4D, X Particles, Art Effects and the like, then you're in the right place. I'm just sharing the knowledge that I picked up along the way. We're all constantly learning and it's great that we can do this together. If you haven't done so already, then please subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell so you don't miss out on future uploads. You have nothing to lose. And if you like this video, then please give it a big thumbs up. It will help my videos get seen by the algorithm thingy. And in turn, this will help others find my videos. And a big thanks to everyone who has subscribed and liked my videos. You guys are awesome. Thank you. So without further ado, let's press on. So in this tutorial, we're going to be creating a three-point lighting setup to light our scene. You may know what three-point lighting is or you may not. So I'm going to explain this quickly for those who don't. Three-point lighting is a traditional method for lighting subjects in photography and film. The lights are positioned so that the subject is lit from three distinct positions. And the sources we used are called the key light, field light and backlight. The backlight is also known as a rim or hair light. The key light is the primary light and is generally the brightest light source and this gives the scene its overall exposure. The fill light is generally positioned on the opposite side of the camera and this fills in or softens the shadows that are created by the key light. And the backlight is positioned behind the subject and this creates a rim of light on the subject. This will help make our subject pop by pushing the subject away from the background, giving us a sense of depth. If you google three point lighting then you can find many examples. You can see the general setup from these diagrams. The setup isn't carved in stone and every one of these articles in Google search will tell you something slightly different. To get a good understanding about lights in a scene, the next time you watch your favourite drama or film, make note of how the scenes are lit. You'll be surprised on how different they are to these examples. Another good source for lighting setups is in the real world. There's some great photography and film tutorials out there, so check them out. It's best to learn the fundamentals first, understand how light and shadows work. Once you get a grasp of it, then you can start experimenting, bend the rules, and I say the term rules very loosely. Basically, it all depends on your subject and how you want your scene to look and feel. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to go through a little bit of housekeeping here, and I made a couple of changes to the project. So I've added a backdrop to our scene here. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be lighting this independently to the sphere, wheel and track. And also, if I just come in here, I just made a polygon selection in our sphere here. So I'm going to be applying a different material to the sphere. So I have a polygon selection tag ready to go for when I bring in my materials. And I've also made my camera visible in our viewport here. So this is going to help me set up my light so this is going to be my reference object here and also the track i made some changes to the track so originally if you remember from the last tutorial we actually cloned the track sweep and i noticed some ultra fine gaps in between the clones so what i did is i took the track sweep out of the cloner object and i cloned the spine instead and then I made a single object by right clicking and selecting connect objects and delete. And then I close the gaps using the weld tool. And then I just drop this into the track sweep instead. So now we have this track without any gaps in there. So if this happens to you, it's a really quick, easy fix. Just do it this way. Your animation will still loop. And everything in my object manager is in layers again. So I have a new null for lights and in this I have two null objects so I have a three point lighting target and a backdrop target and these are going to help me position my lights when I bring in my lights and I've hidden the archive and the camera from the object manager here so everything in here 
is what I need for the tutorial. I don't need to see the camera because I can just turn that on and off in the viewport here. And for this tutorial, I've got my render view docked here and also I've got my node editor docked at the bottom here. And I'm using the node editor because I think it's easier to see on YouTube what I'm doing. I like it a lot better than the shader graph editor. So for me, the node editor is default. If you want to use the old shader graph editor, then just come to your edit here, preferences. And if you come to renderer, redshift, and then scroll down, you have no materials for presets checked. And this is going to use the node editor. If you uncheck this and then create a new material, you're going to be using the old shader graph editor. So before you start your project, just make sure you know which editor you're going to be using because this isn't interchangeable. So if I check this again and I double click the material, it's still going to be using the shader graph editor. But when I create a new material, it's going to be using the node editor. So these aren't interchangeable. So once you've assigned an editor to your material, you can't change it to another editor. So I'm just going to fire up my Reshift render view here. And at the moment, this is looking at the perspective view. I turn my render safety bars off in my viewport here so that we can see the scene properly. But this is exactly what our perspective view is looking at. So I'm going to make sure that I have my padlock checked and this will enable me to just switch to different views in the render view here. If you don't have the padlock checked, then this is going to be an auto. So I'm going to keep this in camera and this will mean that I can just move around in my scene without affecting this view here. And I can see exactly how these lights are going to be affecting my object. This is the way that I like to work. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring in a light and I'm going to light the backdrop. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a gradient across our backdrop with the light fall off. So I'm just going to bring the light in. So I'm just going to use an area light and I'm going to call this area light backdrop. I'm going to pop that into my light snow and I'm going to put that next to my backdrop target. So at the moment this is facing the wrong way. So what I need to do is I need to add a target tag to my light here and there's a couple of ways I can do that. I can right click come to animation tags and add a target tag or I can come into my light and I only learned about this about a month and a half ago and it totally blew my mind. If you come into the light in the object tab at the top here in object where it says type area, add graph, edit graph there. At the end of this dialog here, we have this little arrow and if you just click that, then you have a drop down menu and you can add a target tag or you can add a target tag and null. That's really handy, but they didn't make it very apparent. So I'm going to add a target tag and this is apply the target tag to my light. So all I'm going to do is drop my backdrop target into the target object field there. And now our light is facing the right way. I don't want this light to be lighting the sphere wheel and track directly. So what I'm going to do is if I come into the backdrop light, come to the project tab here, I can actually exclude the sphere wheel and track. So I'm just going to drop the track control in there. So now that's not being lit by the light directly. And also the wheel control. I'm just going to drop that in there as well. So now that this is all silhouetted and we just got some a little bit of ambient light there on our object here. And this is the light bounce from the backdrop there. So I'm just going to just scoot this over a little bit so we can see what we're doing. I don't need to see my node editor at the moment, so I'm just going to close that. 
and I'm going to come to top view. And I'm just going to take this light and I'm just going to scoot this over here to this side here. So I'm going to be creating the gradient. So it's going to be light in this corner and the gradient's going to go down to the other corner there. We'll come to the side view, just raise this up a bit. And I'm just going to position that so we get this nice gradient. I'm just going to watch the specular on the corner here, but that's looking good. So this is going to add a little bit more atmosphere to this scene. And also this is going to help my subject pop from the background. So my key light is going to be lighting the subject from this direction. So this is going to be the brightest part of our object here. And on this side is going to be a fill light and this is going to be the darkest. So this is going to contrast with the background. So I'll have dark over here and this is going to be lighter. This is lighter and this is going to be darker over here. So it's going to help our sphere and wheel just pop from the background there. So contrasting lights and shadows is a really, really good way of lighting your scene there. It makes it a little bit more dramatic. I'm not going to go over dramatic with this, but I just want to make this look a little bit more stylish. So now I've got that set up here. I'm going to add the other lights. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come into clay mode. And I like clay mode to set up the lights because this is really subdued lighting and there's no speckler and it's easy to see the fall off of the lights there. So I'm just going to bring in my first light, which is going to be the key light. So I'm going to be using an area light again, and I'm just going to call this one key. Just give my fat fingers a rest today. And I'm going to drop that into my lights null. This is going to be next to the three point target null. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add a target tag and then I'm going to drop the three point target null into the field here. And now this is lighting our subject here. So the three point target null has the same coordinates as our sphere here. So I like to use a null instead of using the object as a target because that frees us up to actually position the lights and fine tune the lights. If you have it applied to the subject, then you're going to be stuck with that position. It's going to be difficult to make any changes to your light there. So it gives you the opportunity of moving things around and fine tuning. So with the key light selected here, I'm just going to scoot this around. So my camera is here. So I like to start this off at 45 degrees. So I'm just going to bring this around and that's going to be kind of round about there. And you can see that now this is lighting this side of our sphere. I want to kind of catch a little bit of this side. So I'm going to be changing the position of the light. But at the moment, this is lighting the backdrop and it's also creating shadows on the backdrop. So I want to stop that. So I'm going to come into the key light here, come into the project tab and I'm just going to take the backdrop and I'm going to drop that into this field to exclude it. So that's looking good there. So I've got a lot of shadow on this side here. What I want to do is I want to create shadow at the bottom of the sphere here. So I need to do a couple of things. First of all, I need to come into the side view and this is looking up at the sphere here. I want to have it look down at the sphere. I think that works really well with this model. So I'm just going to bring this up and I'm just going to scoot this over until I start getting some nice light on this side here. And I like the way the light is catching the wibbly wobbly wheel there, and casting the shadow on our sphere. This light here, I'm just going to keep as, I'm just going to keep the intensity as 100, but I'm going to change the area shape. So I'm going to change that to disc. I'm going to keep the size as it is there. And let's just come to the top view. So this light is about the same distance as the camera. 
So this is going to create a smaller specular on the object here. If I have this closer, then the specular is going to get really, really big, the reflection of the light. So I might push this back a little bit further in a moment. We're going to see when we come into the regular render. And with this light, this is casting some nice umbra shadows, nice sharp shadows. And then we've got some nice pen umbra shadows being cast on the fall off there. Nice soft feather shadows there as it shines for the wheel. So that's looking good there, I like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring in my fill light. So I'm just going to hold down control and I'm just going to copy this light to the other side. And immediately you see that these shadows are being calmed down here. So I'm going to change the shape of this light. So I'm just going to call this light fill and drop that underneath my key there. I'm going to change the intensity in a moment, but I'm going to make this light really big. So I'm going to say 400 by 1000. And I'm going to change the area shape back to rectangle. So now the intensity of the light has increased because I'll just increase the size of my light there. So I'm going to drop the intensity down to say like 20. That's not looking too bad. I'm going to say maybe 15. And I need to position this light now so that I can get some nice shadows. So I'm just going to come into my side view. And at the moment, this light is kind of looking straight on at the sphere here. So I need to change this. So I'm going to turn off the key light for the moment. And this is a good way of seeing how your lights are affecting the object. And I'm just going to raise this up. I want this light to be looking down on our sphere here. And I'm just going to move this over a little bit. Just so that I can get some nice shadow at the bottom here. I'm not too worried about the shadow on this side, but I am on this side here. This side is going to be fully lit with a key light and this fill light, I just want to concentrate on this side here. So I just want to create a little bit more of a, a shadow underneath there. That's looking good. I like that. So this light is going to be creating this is one of the reasons why I made this light big. It's going to create some nice soft penumbra shadows, nice feather shadows on there. So this is going to work well with the key light. So I'm going to turn the key light back on. And we can see there that we've got some nice shadow underneath there. And it's really softened these shadows of the wheel there. I really like that. So I'm going to leave this as it is for the moment and now i'm going to create my backlight so if i come into my top view just get this right over so you can see what i'm doing so i'm going to take the key light i'm going to use the key light here and i'm just going to hold control and i'm just going to drag that to the other side of the sphere and immediately we see that we have this nice rim of light shining on our sphere here come to the side view and this is looking up at our sphere so I need to raise this up because I want the rim of light to be along the top here so this shadow is going to lead into the rim of light there and I'm going to turn off my key and fill here and also I'm just going to name this one back Just keep things simple. And you can see here, if we just come in here, that we've got this nice rim of light happening here. So I'm just gonna position this a little bit. That's looking good there. I like that, it's kind of like an eclipse of a planet or something. So I'm going to leave everything the same in the backlight here. So with these lights, I'm just using the intensity 
I'm not sort of like doing any fancy with the exposure here. So the exposure EAF, I kind of think of this as like fine tuning your exposure there. So this is kind of like um, if you're into photography, this is going to be like your exposure compensation. So I'm just going to be using intensity with all these lights here, but I may use the exposure EV just to fine tune the exposure there, but I generally find intensity is okay. So I'm just going to turn my key and fill light back on. And that's looking okay. I'm going to calm this shadow down the bottom here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the fill light here and I'm just going to bring this down just a tad. That's looking better there. It's not looking too stark now, this shadow here. It's looking quite nice. Maybe just bring this up a little bit more. But we can make some adjustments later when we come into the regular render. So that's basically your three point lighting setup. And how you position the lights is going to be different for different subjects. So if you're lighting a bus, you don't want your lights too high because you don't want to give your subject panda eyes, etc. So it all depends on your subject. So what I'm trying to do is just create something a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more dramatic and I'm using the shadows and the lights to achieve that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to come into the regular render here and that's looking good. This is overexposed because I don't have any materials on the I don't have any materials in our scene at the moment. And that's what we're gonna do now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna scoot this over and just bring my node editor in and my material manager there. I'm using the standard materials in Resha 3.5. And to find that, you just need to come into your materials drop down, and at the bottom you've got standard. And I really like this material because it just frees up a lot of time for setting up materials and it helps us to be a little bit more creative. Everything you need is in the base properties now. So you have your base, reflection, transmission, subsurface, sheen, thin film, coat, emission, geometry. Everything is in here. So everything in the base properties is probably 99.99% .99 of what you need. Then you have optimizations and advanced tabs here just to fine tune your materials. But this is basically everything you need. So in this tutorial, I'm just gonna be going through the base, reflection, and thin film. And also I'm gonna be creating a PBR material with a nice material I downloaded from Ambient CG. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm just gonna delete this one here. I don't need that extra material in my material manager here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a PBR material to texture our sphere here. Just want to scoot this right up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off my wheel and my spokes here, just so that we can see what we're doing. And I'm going to come into my perspective view here. And in my render view here, I'm going to come into perspective as well. So I'm just going to apply my sphere material to my sphere geo. So the PBR material that I downloaded, I got that from Ambient CG. So I'll leave a link in the description below. And I really like this material. It's nice, subtle material. It's got some nice wear and tear on it. It's going to be nice because it's going to be picked up in our specular and our reflections there. And it's a white material, you can color this, you can just color that with a color correct node. Or you can just use your lights to add a little bit of color to your subject there. So I'm going to be adding a little bit of color to my lights and this is going to work really well with that. So when you download the material, you get everything that you need, all the bits and pieces that you need. 
So when you download the, this material, you've got your, you've got two normals. You want to use normal GL because that's what we're using in Redshift, which is OpenGL. And I'm just going to move these around so I can get a little bit more room here. I'm not going to be using the displacement in the final material, but I'm just going to be using this to show you something. So I'm just going to pop this over here a little bit. So I want to put this straight into my displacement. This is one of the things I like about the node editor. It's a little bit more intuitive. So my output here is yellow. I can't put that into the displacement input here because this is purple. So this tells me that I need to add a displacement node. So I'm just going to press C. And I'm going to bring in a displacement. So I'm going to take the out color here and pop that into the text map. And I'm going to take the output here and pop that into the displacement. So nothing's happened at the moment because we need to add a Redshift object tag. I'm going to right click, come to render tags, Redshift object. So I would just come to the geometry tab. We're not using tessellation. We're using displacement. So I need to override the defaults here. I just need to enable displacement and immediately this is working. Now you can see that because my object here is a, a little bit of a weird shape, this isn't working well with this and we've got some artifacts happening along the edge here. This is way too much of a displacement for when you're using this. Do you want to probably take this down to something like 0.05 or 0.04? because you want this to be subtle, but this isn't working. And this is a good demonstration of what our actual textures here are gonna be like on our material. And you probably think that you can come into the material tag and just change the projection there to something different, but that doesn't work for me. And what does work is using a triplanar node. So I'm just gonna bring one of them in. This is going to help us project the material onto our sphere. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pipe this into the color for the moment. Let's take the displacement off. And if I just pop that into the color, everything goes red because we just got image X activated here. So I've got the same image on each axis checked. If I uncheck that, then we're going to have image Y and image Z as well. We can project an image into the red, an image into the blue, and an image into the green here. Then we've got some blending going on between the planes here. The blend amount is on 0.1. I can bring this up to one, and that's gonna really blend everything out. Or I can just put that as zero, I have no blending whatsoever. But who's going to do that? Well, I am for the moment. So this is going to be easy for us to project our image. So we're not going to have any stretching. We're not going to have any artifacts along the edges here. This is going to work really well. So I'm going to take this triplanar here and I'm just going to drop that in between my texture and my displacement node there. And I'm going to take the color. I'm going to pop that into image X and then I'm going to make sure that same image on each axis is checked. I'm going to take the out color of the triplanar and pop that into the text map. And then I'm just going to connect this to the displacement again. And now you can see that this is evenly distributed over our sphere. And I really like that. So now you can see the sharp edges of our planes there. So we need to smooth that out. And I find that 0.4 is a good number. 
for this material. And now we have this nice, I'm just gonna move this up a little bit. So now we have this nice distribution and you can't see the joins. It's looking really, really good. If I was gonna use the displacement in my material, I'll come to the redshift object tag and then I'll just like pop the displacement scale to something like 0 0.04. And then that's gonna be a lot more subtle for when we use our material. But I find that the displacement is very much like the normal. And if you use a the normal, then it's gonna render quicker than using the displacement. But these results are pretty much the same. So I'm just gonna be using a normal. I just want to use the displacement just to show you how this is going to project. And I'm just going to take the triplanar and I'm going to copy this over. So I want to do this three times. And now I'm going to put my color, roughness and normal GL into our material here. We don't need to see these anymore, so I'm going to delete them. So what I need to do is I need to come into each of these materials here and I want to change the color space. So I heard that Auto does a pretty good job of working out what you got here, but I like to force these. So if I come to File IO and for the color, I'm going to use sRGB and for everything else, I'm going to use raw. And this is going to help Redshift read the values correctly in our maps there. And now all I've got to do is connect the dots. So I'm going to take the out color, pop that into image X, and then the out color here of the triplanar into the color. And then with the roughness, same thing. And the out color of the triplanar is going to go into the reflection roughness. And with the normal here, I've got to pop that into the bump map. And as you can see, I've got yellow and yellow. I need the purple. So I'm going to use a bump map mode. So I'm going to take the normal GL, pop that into the triplanar, image X, and then the out color of the triplane I'm going to pop into the bump map and this is going to be input and then I'm going to take the output of the bump map and pop that into the bump map it's that simple so now we have our normal showing there this is a little bit over the top and that's because if you come into the bump map you can see that the input map type is height field we're actually using normal so we need to change that so I'm going to change that to tangent space normal and now we get something that's really subtle and it's showing up nicely in our specular there. This is a really nice material for picking up some detail in your specular and your reflections there. So that's my PBR material done. And I'm just going to scoot the node editor down. We don't need to see that because I'm not going to be using that anymore. And I'm going to come back into my camera view. And then I'm just going to turn on my wheel cloner. And I'm going to turn on my spoke sweep. And that's looking good. I like that. We're going to be sorting out the specular in a little while, but that's looking really, really good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to work on the wibbly wobbly wheel here. So this wheel spokes material, I'm just going to drop onto the wheel cloner and onto our spoke speed. And this is going to be a metallic material. So in the standard material, creating a metallic material is dead easy. We just use the base and reflection to control our material here. I'm just creating the basic metallic material. And these are the defaults at the moment. So I have my color 21.4% in my value there. The weight's on full and basically weight is 
turning it off and turning it on. So I'm keeping my diffuse model as Oronea. That's good for smooth materials. So if you add some diffuse roughness, you might need to change that to the on-land version spheres, but I'm just keeping it as Oronea. And to create your metal, all you need to do is just come to the metalness and you just pop that up to one. And there we have metal. I'm just gonna come into my perspective view. So we can see what we're doing here. So this is our metal. And how we control the color of the metal is in the color in our base here. So you can make this a nice red metal if you want to, or whatever color you want. And then you can increase the brightness and the lightness of it as well. So we'll just bring that right down to zero there. That's just going to turn that off. We'll just bring it up to 100%. That's going to be really, really bright there. So I'm just probably just going to bring this down to around about just around about 50% there. That's looking good. Now with my metal this set to one, this is going to override the index of refraction. So this figure here is irrelevant now because I have my metalness set to one. We can't use the IRR now. So changing that's not going to make any difference. So just going to leave that as it is. And to control your edge tint, you just need to change the color in your reflection here. So I'll just bring that right up to red here. You can see now that we've got some edge tint going on there, but this is way too much. You need to do something that's very, very subtle. There you go. So we've got some nice tint happening with our metal there. So it's not like the old days. It's really easy to set up metallic materials in the standard material. Whether this is an accurate metallic material, that's arguable. But this frees us up to be a lot more creative and we're not bogged down in working out values for materials, etc. I'm just going to turn my edge tint off here. So that this is back to white now. I might add a little bit of edge tint to our material in a little while, but I'm just going to leave this as it is for the moment. So that's our metallic material set up and it's that quick and simple. So I'm going to use the same material for our cut out here. So I'm just going to drop that onto my sphere geo. And then I'm just going to use my selection tag and pop that in there. So now we have our metallic cut out there with our wibbly wobbly wheel. That's looking good. And I'm going to create another metallic material and this is going to be for the track. So I'm going to pop that onto the track control. So I'm going to pop the metal this up. And this color here, I'm just going to make around about maybe around about 45. I want this to be a little bit darker than the material that we have on our wibbly wobbly wheel. And I want to add some variation to the color there. So I'm not going to be using the color in the reflection. I'm just going to be using something different. So I'm going to be using the thin film. Now the thin film is exactly what it is, is you can add films to any object. So you can create bubbles and then add a, a thin film to a bubble. And if you're creating a bubble, then that's going to be 1.333 in the index of refraction. And then you can just add your thickness. So this is going to add a little bit of a spectrum to your bubble there. You don't have to just use this on bubbles. You can use this on anything. So I'm just going to add a little bit of a thin film to my track here. I'm going to keep the index of refraction to 1.5 for the moment, but I'm just going to bring the thickness up. And as I bring the thickness up, let's come to around about here. You can see we're now getting this variation in our track here. I'm going to come back to frame zero. And 
What I like about this is that in the reflection, we get different values of our spectrum there. So this is kind of turning out a little bit orangey there. So I'm just going to play around with this until I get something I like. So I'm going to probably just bring my IRR up. So there you go, so something like this. So you just play around with this. If you bring your index of refraction down below one, that's really gonna muck up reflections there. So keep it above one. And then just play around with the thickness until you get something that you like. So I've got some nice variation of colors in my reflection there, which I like. So now I'm just gonna add the material to my backdrop. I'm just going to turn off the reflection. So I'm going to turn the weight of my reflection down. I just want this to be diffused. And I'm just going to bring up my value in my color here until I get something I like. Okay, I think that's looking nice there. So I'm just going to change the color of my track here. So I'll just come back into the track and I'm just going to just find a different value. There you go, that's better there. It's more in line with the subdued grayscale there. I like that a lot. So I'm just gonna leave that as it is. So we get some nice different kind of color in our reflections there. That's looking pretty cool. A lot of variation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to calm my speckler down here. And what I might do, if I just scoot right over here, just come to the side view. I'm just going to take my backlight here and I'm just going to scoot this around just a little bit. There you go, so I haven't got so much of a reflection in my track here. And we've got more of a even rim there on the edge there. I like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna calm this speckler down. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. If you come into the material of the sphere, the PBR material, and I'm just gonna come into the reflection here and Normally with dielectric materials, etc., and stuff, probably want to keep your reflection as 100% white to be more accurate. But I like to play with this figure a little bit. So if you just turn this all the way down, so we've got no color whatsoever. So if you think of this is off and this is on, we can actually cut out the specter and have still have the illumination of the light there. So the trouble of doing it this way is gonna affect all the lights in the reflection of the material. So I'm gonna bring this value up to say around about 85%. I just wanna calm it down a little bit. And the way I'm going to control this specular here is if I can actually come into the light. So, so if I come into the backlight and I come to the details, we can fine tune our lights. And the value I'm gonna play with is the reflection. So again, if you bring that all the way down, we're just gonna have illumination. We're not gonna get much of a specular. But then we're now losing the specular in our wibbly wobbly wheel there. So I don't wanna turn this right off. So I'm just going to bring this up until I get something I like. And I think that's looking quite nice there. So here's a quick tip. If you want to control the specular of the backlight on different objects, sometimes the easiest thing to do is duplicate the backlight and use the project tab to exclude the objects from different lights. And then you control the specular on the sphere without having to affect the specular on the wheel here and the track. So there's options. 
And working this way with these lights and redshift and stuff, you can really, really think out of the box. But I think that's looking good there. And I like that on the wheel. I'm just going to just scroll down a little bit. I'm just going to have a look at how this is looking. So I think that's looking quite smart there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to brighten up this metallic material a little bit. So I'm just going to come into the base here and I'm just going to pop this up a little bit just to brighten up a little bit. That's looking better there. And I'm just going to come into the fill light here and I'm going to do the same in the details. I'm just going to bring the reflection down not a lot just to calm this speckler down on the sphere here and i think that's looking quite smart so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to add a little bit of color to our scene here and i'm going to do that through the lights so i'm in the field light at the moment and if you come to the object tab you can just play around with the color you can just play around with the temperature or the color or the color and temperature but just coming to temperature for the moment and if you just bring that right down here we're going to be adding some more red into our light there if you just bring this right up we're going to be adding some blue so that's a pretty good way of adding a little bit of variation of colors to your lights because all your lights are kind of different in your room if you look at your lights you're going to have some that are more orangey some are more blue depends on the lights but I'm just going to use color and I find I have more control over my color and the lights then so I'm just going to kind of warm this fill up and I'm just going to add a little bit of color to that just to warm that up a little bit and then I'm going to come into the backlight here and I want to contrast the color here so if you look at the color wheel orange and blues are opposite to each other those colors are really good for contrasting your lights there so i'm just going to come into the backlight just bring in a bit of blue so you don't want to do this too much you don't want to muddy your shadows here just keep this nice and subtle and I think it's looking good there. So we get some nice blues happening in our wibbly wobbly wheel here. Some nice orange on our sphere there. So that's looking pretty good there. So that's your three point lighting setup with the materials. And that's looking quite smart. And I'm not going to spend too much time in sorting out these speckler here. I'll, I'll probably fine tune this speckler here. But I'm just going to leave this as it is for the moment. But the other thing I like to do because this side isn't popping enough for me and I'm just going to add another backlight and I'm going to select the backlight here and I'm just going to copy this around hold down control and just bring this around like this and I'm going to make some changes to this light here so I've got some nice speckler happening on our track on this side as well I'm going to, if I just come into the side view here, I'm just going to raise this up a little bit. And I kind of want this nearer the top here, just to give a little bit of accent on the edge here. That's looking pretty good there. So I'm just going to, so I'm just going to rename this as back left. And I'm just going to decrease the intensity and I'm going to come into the details and I'm just going to change the reflection here. I don't want that specular to be so powerful. There you go, something like that. So this adds a little bit more dimension to this side of the sphere here. That's looking pretty cool. 
And in the background, I'm just gonna probably just add a little bit of blue, just so it matches the speckler on this side. So I'm just going to just bring the color up a little bit. Just wanna like a hint of blue there. And that's looking pretty cool. That's looking really good there. So I'm just going to do a bucket render and we're gonna have a look. And I think that's looking pretty smart so far. So we have a lot of control over our lights and we can create some really nice scenes. And in the time I've taken to record this tutorial, I think this is a pretty good start for a well-balanced scene. It's a bit longer than I intended, but I really wanted to explain the lights and shadows and the thought process on how and why I position the lights. And the way I set up these lights is working really well with this model. But every scene and subject is different and you will find that this setup won't work for you or for another scene. So play around with and study your lights. Watch for the shadows they create and how they react with other lights in the scene. The first light you create is the key light and remember that light generally sets the exposure for the scene. And it's all down to your materials as well, how you set up your materials and how they're going to react with the lights. So you find it's a balancing act of just going backwards and forwards trying different things. The other thing you can do is add some texture to your lights and create some variation to your reflections and specular. But that's a topic for another day and I think this is looking really good so far so I'm just going to leave this as it is. During this tutorial I gave you a brief overview of the standard material. The materials I created today are really simple and they work well with this scene. But obviously you can add a lot more detail if you need to. There's loads more to play with and discover. But the main thing is this material frees up our time and lets us be more creative and I like it a lot. So I'm going to leave this tutorial here. I could play with lights and materials all day but as I say a project isn't finished it's only abandoned. So I hope you learned something today that you can take away and apply to your future projects. If you like this tutorial then give it a big thumbs up. Thanks for stopping by and I shall see you in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Hopefully what I've shown you today will help you in your future projects. If you like what you've seen, then please give this video a big thumbs up. Like, subscribe and tinker that notification bell so you don't miss out on future content. It will help the YouTube algorithm thingy help others find my content. Also, you can check out my latest experiments, concepts and dailies on Instagram at Almost Daily Render. And as always, any feedback and questions, please leave them in the comments section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you have any problems, I'll be glad to help. And while you're here, you can check out my other content. Thanks for watching and I shall see you in the next video.